thank you very much for that um, very kind introduction. Um, I'm really excited to be in a mental health trust. I've not been invited to a mental health trust before, so, um, but I think these messages are just as important whatever um, environment we're working in. So um, I hope everyone can take something away from today. I guess I should start by saying hello, my name's Kate. Um, I'm a final year elderly medicine registrar and I'm going to tell you my story through illness over the past three years um, and some of the experiences I've, I've been through. So this was me, um, I'm 29 years old, happily married to my husband Chris. Um, we have a lovely home together in Wakefield. Um, I'm in my third year of training to become a consultant in medicine for older people an ambition that I've had since I was a little girl. We're just starting to think about planning a family. Idyllic, you'd think. Nothing wrong with that life. No money worries. <laughs> Lovely family and friends to support us. And we decided to take a holiday to California. Chris has family out there um, and we took his grandma out to meet her new great-grandchildren. <coughs> It's lovely weather and we're enjoying a fantastic trip. But for the little right-sided niggling back pain that I've got, that's getting to be a little bit more than a niggle. And so soon after a few days on the trip, I, I was in agony. Um, and Chris took it on himself to take me to the hospital because I'd procrastinated about my symptoms for far too long. And when we got to the emergency room, it became clear that I was really very seriously unwell. My kidneys had failed and after a few basic investigations it became apparent that the reason for that was that my abdomen and my pelvis were full of tumours. Bang, out of the blue, with no warning, at the age of 29, I'd got cancer. I was patched up in the States. They popped some stents into my ureters to get my kidneys working again and I came home to pursue further investigations and treatment with the NHS. And this is where my, my illness story really starts. Um, I was ad admitted to St James's Hospital um, via gynaecology because they um, thought that I probably had ovarian cancer and I went through multiple painful procedures and further investigations at which point I was diagnosed with a very rare and aggressive form of sarcoma. It's a disease that just affects one in two million people um, and usually affects young um, adolescent boys so why it was picking on an approaching middle-aged woman I'm not sure. It spread to my liver and bones, so I was in an incurable palliative situation. I underwent five rounds of intensive palliative chemotherapy at that point. That was a very tough journey. I was in and out of hospital. I had bone marrow failure, febrile neutropenia, the other complications of my bone marrow not working, such as bleeding. I was really very, very unwell. And on New Year's Eve 2011, I, I made a big decision. Chris and I celebrated being together 10 years on that day. Um, we did that in hospital. And with the help of the nurses on the teenage cancer unit, um, it was made a nicer experience. They got us a table and we had a little, a little meal together and they left me alone for a couple of hours with Chris. Dimmed the lights and had some music and I even had some wine. Um, but then Chris went home and I, I was confined back to my bed for a blood transfusion. And I was looking out over the Leeds city skyline watching the fireworks and I made a big decision to stop my chemotherapy at that point. The burdens of treatment were really outweighing the benefits um, and I wanted to get some quality of life back. So three weeks after I made that decision, I went back to work. Um, I was working on the stroke unit at Pinderfields at that time. And I just constantly through treatment, all I could think about was going back to work and looking after my own patients again. 
I love being a doctor. I think it's a very privileged position to be in. And I'm so lucky to be able to do the career that I've always wanted to do. There then followed a period of about 20 months where I was relatively stable from a medical point of view. Um, this was unexpected as this cancer usually progresses very quickly. Um, I managed to progress with my career. Um, I managed to do lots of things and we've got a bucket list and enjoyed a lot of lovely experiences. Um, I raised a lot of money for charity. But in September last year, I started to feel poorly again. Um, I found a lump in my neck and I was getting a lot of tubby pain. Um, and it became apparent quite quickly that my cancer had progressed again. So then I had the heart-wrenching decision of whether to go back to chemotherapy or not. Um, I did. Um, and I got through that experience. Again, it was a very, very tough journey. That all finished in February. Um, and I'm just getting my life back on track now. I've had a lot of problems with infections um, and things, but I am back at work um, and all this is keeping me very busy. So what I thought I'd do this afternoon is talk about values. Um, everyone's got mission statements and culture and values at the moment, haven't they? It's all come out of the Francis report that organisations need to, need to have have culture and, um, and values that we all believe in. Um, but I've got my own core values that are important to me as both a clinician and a patient and, and a person. And my first core value um, is communication. It's what I do as an elderly medicine registrar. I can't do operations or fancy procedures, but I can talk to people. Um, that's what what I do. We have to talk to people about balancing the risks and benefits of different treatments, often in the light of very little evidence. Um, we have to talk through end of life care and very difficult decision making in that context. We talk to relatives when they're upset or try to manage people's expectations. That's, that's part of my job and that's what I've been doing, doing for years. But it's really been brought home to me as a patient why communication is so vitally important and shouldn't just be a buzzword that is banded around executive meetings. Because when communication is done badly, it can really cause lasting psychological harm. So I'm going to tell you a story now um, and I'd like you to try and put yourself in my position. You're 29 years old. You know you've got cancer, you think it's confined to your tummy. So you're expecting to have an operation, possibly some chemotherapy, with the hope of a cure. I'm in a side room, I'm in pain, and I'm by myself. And an SHO I've never met before comes to talk to me about the results of the MRI scan that I'd had the previous day. He sat down in the chair next to my bed and after a cursory introduction, with no checking of my baseline understanding or asking if I wanted anyone with me, blurted out, I'm afraid your cancer's spread. He then couldn't leave the room quick enough, didn't have any knowledge to back up what he'd just said, and I never saw him again. He didn't tell the nurses what I'd been told, so I was left in a <coughs> deep psychological state, having in a deep psychological distress, having just received my death sentence with no support. That's not how I like to break bad news. And that experience has really hurt me psychologically over the last three years. It's amazing how, if you do it well though, that these news, bad news can be easier to hear. So when my consultant told me my definitive diagnosis. This was probably worse news in the grand scheme of things. This was a definite death sentence. He sat down on my bed, he held my hand and he gently delivered the news to me. He then sat in silence and gave me time to 
absorb that information for what felt like ages. That gave me the opportunity to cry and then to get my sensible head back on and get back to thinking about what we were going to do in that situation. Hearing that news in that gentle, comforting, tactile, reassuring way was much easier than the first experience. So communication really does matter. And every little time we speak to a patient matters. So we need to think about how we do that. So my second core value is something that I talk about a lot, which is the little things really do matter. And little things, I mean sitting down next to somebody, introducing yourself to somebody, holding somebody's hand when they're upset, if that's appropriate. Giving people that extra moment of your time. You really appreciate those little things when you're a patient. It makes a massive difference to your day and you remember them. So a few months ago I was very sick. I had a serious infection. I wasn't getting better on very strong antibiotics. My bone marrow was completely gone and I was, I was just really, really poorly. And it was a Saturday night and I was deteriorating. So the consultant had been called in to come and see me. And besides all the things that he did for me, like phoning the urology doctors on call and the radiologists and the microbiologists and changing all my treatment round, one of the things that I remember about that evening was him gently placing his hand on my arm, kneeling beside my bed and saying, Kate, you're going to be okay. We're going to look after you. I remember that because I felt looked after and I, it felt nice that he'd recognised how vulnerable and frightened I was feeling at that point. Those little things, they really do matter. My third core value aligns with a lot of values of NHS organisations, which is that the person really should be at the centre of everything we do. But it's so easy to forget the patient, isn't it, in the systems that we've set up in hospitals. Another story, which again goes around a hospital admission with infection. So I'd come into hospital after chemotherapy with a fever. And I'd been put on the standard protocol antibiotics. I'd been seen by a consultant and moved off to another ward. My care had been nice and quick and everyone had been on the ball. At lunchtime on the new ward, a nurse came to give me some antibiotics. But they weren't the antibiotics that had been prescribed on the original ward. And I found this very strange. They were an antibiotic that's used for much more serious infections. The first thought that went through my head was, um, they've got the wrong drug chart, somebody's just written it up on the wrong drug chart or the wrong drug charts come with me to the new ward. But the second more serious thought that went through my mind was, oh gosh, they've got the Domestos out and must be really sick. Unfortunately, it was the latter. And looking back over my notes, what had happened was the consultant had seen me He'd been very diligent and looked at all my microbiology results. He'd picked up the a few weeks previously, I'd grown a very resistant organism in my urine. So he'd asked the junior doctor to um, get the microbiologist's um, advice. Junior doctor had done that, documented it beautifully, prescribed the appropriate antibiotics. I'd received those antibiotics. That's safe care. I'd received appropriate treatment. But it forgot one thing. And that was me. Nobody told me. And I think if you could write across the top of my medical notes, Kate wants to know everything, perhaps we should. Um, this was a serious change in my treatment, but I wasn't communicated with at all. And I think I've certainly done that 
in my career as a junior doctor. And it's very easy to just get lost in your jobs list and ticking off jobs. But I think we do have to think about our patients more. When I worked in my first house job at Dewsbury Hospital, I worked for a very, very wise clinician called Dr Kemp. Um, he was a diabetes doctor and he really took me under his wing because he knew I wanted to become a physician. And he used to say to me, Kate, being a good physician is about painting a picture. You fill in little bits of the painting every day um, and eventually you get a masterpiece. Um, and I guess that's what William Ursel was saying all those years ago. And that all leads into my fourth key value, which is about seeing me, not just my disease. I've been referred to by two consultant oncologists within earshot as that girl with DSRCT. It's not very nice to be re reduced to a rare cancer when there's a lot of other things going on in my life. You know, I, I'm a wife, I'm an auntie to three gorgeous nephews, I'm a doctor, I love to play the flute, I like baking, I like cooking, I like going for walks, I love swimming. There's a lot more to my life than, than just having a cancer. And I put cancer down at the bottom somewhere in terms of priorities. But I think we do start to think of our patients as conditions or bed numbers. And that's something that we really should try and avoid. To dehumanise an experience coming into hospital, you leave a lot of your independence at the door. Things are taken off you, control of your medications taken off you, when you eat taken away from you. You know, all those decisions that you make in your normal daily life are just gone. But to be referred to as your disease state rather than your name um, is, is something that I find really distressing actually. Um, this is a tweet I sent when I was in hospital last year um, on a urology ward and I normally tweet my whole 140 character limit so when I send short tweets it means that I'm angry. <laughs> um, and this is something that was happening to me all the time and it was just starting to really irk me that people kept referring to me as bed seven Somebody even said to me, bed seven, would you like a drink? It's not, not nice to be referred to as a bed number. And this is a hospital selfie. Um, I took it because I think it demonstrates how distressed and tired I was at the time. Um, I'd come into hospital ill with an infection as usual um, and I was being tortured by sleep deprivation. It was my third day of being in hospital and I'd been woken up at two o'clock, four o'clock, six o'clock every night <coughs> and this day I just got to the point where I just needed to sleep. So my nurse had very kindly said to me we'll leave you be this morning Kate just you know get some rest. But nobody else seemed to care about what she'd said. So the phlebotomist came in to try and take my blood, although I'd already had my blood taken from my um, porter cath earlier that morning. Um, then a healthcare assistant came in to change my bed. Couldn't that wait until I'd woken up? Somebody came to give me a drink. I don't actually drink tea and coffee and I'd been on this ward several times in the past and I'd, I'd met the housekeepers before but yet I was still woken up to see if I wanted a drink. And then the straw that brought the camels back was the cleaner who literally yelled at me until I woke up to ask if he could clean my room. I just think sometimes we run wards for the convenience of our staff and not for the benefit of our patients. I know there are things that have to be done in a ward environment 
um, or in, in community. There are things that have to be done, but I think sometimes we just need to try and work with our patients a little bit more to make things a nicer experience for them. I'm going to move on now and tell you the story of Hello My Name Is. Um, so in August last year, I had an operation to replace the stents that drain my kidneys. Um, I was out of hospital within a few few hours. Um, everything had gone perfectly. And then 36 hours later, I got a fever and I was very poorly with a low blood pressure. <coughs> so I ended up having to come back into hospital. It was quite evident that I had post-operative sepsis. So we came back through the emergency department and I was triaged by a nurse I used to work with, um, which was lovely. And then things started to slide a little bit. Um, I was seen by a junior doctor who called himself one of the doctors. He didn't have a name or a role and didn't seem to want to part with that information when I asked him. Then a healthcare assistant or a clinical support worker, I'm not sure which, <coughs> came to do my cannula or my bloods. She didn't have a name. Then a nurse came to give me my antibiotics. She didn't have a name either. Then I met Brian. And Brian was a porter who was going to take me from the emergency department to the urology ward. <coughs> he introduced himself. I remember. He checked um, whether I was in pain or not. He got me an extra pillow and an extra blanket to make sure I was comfortable. He took extra care pushing me over the bumps in the corridor so as not to exacerbate my pain. And the whole time he was talking to me and my husband reassuringly. Brian was doing those little things that really do matter. They then followed a week-long admission on the urology ward where lots and lots of people didn't introduce themselves to me. Um, it was healthcare assistants, nurses, consultants, everyone really. Um, but when somebody did introduce themselves, it made such a massive difference to how I was feeling. It's very lonely being in hospital. I don't think people recognise that sometimes. But it is a very lonely experience and the interactions that you have with your healthcare professionals looking after you is sometimes the only interactions that you might have in a day. And if those interactions don't even come with a name, then it's, it's again, quite dehumanising. It's also nice to make a human connection with someone and, and build a relationship. So I was sort of reflecting on this absent introductions with my husband one evening. Um, and he is a very practical um, kind of guy and he told me to stop whinging about it and do something. Um, and the result of that conversation was hashtag hello my name is. So we decided to use my already significant influence on social media to start a campaign to inspire, encourage and remind healthcare staff about the importance of introduction. Um, and sort of try to start a social movement in essence. We de developed a logo with a friend who's a graphic designer and my IT geek brother designed us a website to collect all the um, activities that people have been doing into one place. I firmly believe that introductions are far more than common courtesy. Like I've said, it's about a human connection, building trust and rapport and that all-important therapeutic relationship. But it's also about power. As a patient, you're really down here in the power stakes and the healthcare staff are up here. And that's because of information. Healthcare staff know so much about you before they even meet you. They know lots and lots of intimate details about your life about your health conditions. But a simple introduction can try and redress that balance a little bit. I wrote a blog about 
my experiences and invited people to pledge their support for the campaign. And I encourage people to use the hashtag on Twitter. I was soon writing articles for the BMJ and other high impact journals. Oh. Um, and then all of a sudden people started to take the idea, take the logo and use it in their workplaces to um, start a social movement. So people started to put the logo on clinical areas and screen savers. Um, they use it on lots of conference badges. Um, there were cupcakes, there were posters, selfie campaigns. Um, students have been very active with this idea. Um, people have designed lanyards and put it on their ID badges. Um, it's been sort of a massive social movement, really. And then the, the government got hold of it. So if you turn to page 36 of the government's response to the Francis inquiry, you'll find a box all about, hello, my name is. Jeremy Hunt himself even mentioned it in a speech that he gave about continuity of care. He didn't actually ask my permission to do that, so he got a little bit of a battering on Twitter. <laughs> I went to the International Forum um, for Quality and Safety in, in Healthcare um, in Paris um, in March and there I gave a talk about hello my name is, I had a poster and I even indoctrinated one of my own healthcare heroes, Don Berwick. I've been very active on the conference scene in the last few months. <laughs> um, we spoke at the Expo in Manchester and I just um, closed the NHS Confederation Conference, which was quite a big stage. There's been a bit of celebrity support as well. Um, so I don't know how many you'll recognise, but um, that's Sophie, the Countess of Wessex. So there's a bit of royal support. Um, Michelle Rue Jr. supporting the campaign. Biz Stone, the founder of Twitter. Um, we've got Ben Coe in there um, and Team Shimano when they were in Leeds for the Tour de France. I could now add the picture of the Prime Minister that I met on Wednesday, um, who's also supporting um, the idea. You can count how much impact a hashtag is having on Twitter if you use um, analytic programmes. Um, and if you go to Simpler, um, it's currently a little bit more than 48 million um, Twitter impressions. That means that the hashtag has, has reached 48 million people in some kind of capacity. Um, there's been, it works out about four tweets an hour about, about this topic. Um, and it was a big part of NHS Change Day as well. And I do this an awful lot. I was in Bolton yesterday talking to their new doctors. I'm here today. I'm talking again next week in Leeds. I think, well, why is this girl spending her final months of life going on about something that seems so simplistic? But I genuinely believe that this is the beginning of what we see as compassionate care. And it's having a positive impact on the NHS. People are embracing it as a good idea and it's bringing about positive culture change. And it's so difficult to do that in the NHS these days. It doesn't really cost any money, mm. this campaign. Maybe printing out a few signs, getting your photography team on board. Um, but it's changing and causing a buzz around organisations. In Leeds, I've never known anything like it. We had 3,000 people sign up to the campaign within two weeks of us starting it. Everyone's going mad for their individualised Hello My Name Is badges um, and our massive photo wall that we're going to install in Bexley Wing. It's a real buzz around the corridor. I can't walk anywhere in, in Jimmy's without giving myself an extra 10 minutes because I know I'm going to get stopped by so many people. It can change things and it can make things better, but it does improve patient experience at no cost 
and hardly any time. The feedback I'm getting from patients via social media has been incredibly positive. One of the things that I'm like I'm collecting is, is patient feedback and when patients have had negative experiences, where those have happened. And quite a lot of the time it's been mental health experiences, where particularly in acute mental health um, experiences where people feel that they haven't been introduced properly to the people that are looking after them. And I think that's really sad um, and needs to change. I'm uh, going to jump out of a plane in two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. With a fit man strapped to my back. <laughs> um, you can't really see it, but it's um, Kate Dash Granger. I don't know where that's gone. But, um, so if anyone wanted to sponsor me, that would be amazing. Um, and I'm going to just finish by plug in my books. I've written two books about my experiences. Um, they're reflections on what it's like to be on the other side of healthcare. Um, and I think there's lessons for everybody, no matter what um, specialty you work in. All the money, um, f all the profits from the sale of those books goes towards Yorkshire Cancer Centre Appeal. Um, together with Chris, we've raised £130,000 for the charity so far. And I would like to make that a quarter of a million before I die. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you.